All right. Welcome, everybody, to our first ever live interview here at Connect the Watts. Today, we have a very special guest who I am very excited to have us talk and talk about how to ride our bikes with less pain, <clears throat> less injuries, and perform at our best. He has a brand new 14-day indoor cycling mobility challenge, which is 100% free and begins today, actually, Monday, December 6th. And I'm talking, of course, about Dr. Kelly Starrett, the co-founder, head coach, and physical therapist of The Ready State, which is an online coaching or online mobility coaching service that gives personalized follow-along mobility drills that are customized for your body and your goals. Kelly was also the co-founder of one of the first CrossFit affiliates, San Francisco CrossFit, and is the co-author of the New York Times bestsellers, Becoming a Simple Leopard, Ready to Run, and Wall Street Journal bestseller, Deskbound. He works with athletes and coaches from all over the NFL, NBA, USA Olympic team. In fact, it's kind of hard to find professional organizations who don't seek out Kelly and his expertise around solving and preventing injuries and maximizing performance. So without making you wait any longer, Kelly, welcome, and thanks for joining us here on Connect the Watts. It is nice to see you again, my friend. It's great. I haven't seen you in like five, six years. It's been a long time. You're just fatter and I'm older. It's perfect. <laughs> I got some good pictures to show at the end. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, um, thanks for joining. I want to learn more about this. Uh, you know, I saw on uh, Instagram the 14-day indoor cycling mobility challenge most of our viewers here are ride Peloton or like Nordic track or other company bikes, sometimes exclusively, uh, but many times it's the primary method for their fitness training. Yeah. Um, and so this, I thought this would be a great opportunity for them to learn more about positioning, mobility, you know, figuring out injuries and pain, all the stuff that, you know, you've been talking about. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about you know, what the challenge is? Yeah, you know, what's amazing about the bike is that, first of all, I should just go on record as saying I am a cyclist. I'm like the world's biggest mountain biker. And, yeah. uh, you know, I look at my friends, my pro friends I'm riding with, and I'm like, oh, look, you're putting out 170 watts and I'm putting out 320 watts and we're just riding to the, to the, to the head <laughs> of the, you know, head of the trail. Um, our family's into mountain biking. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've been riding my bike my whole life and have always loved taking my fitness to the bike, you know, using the bike as an adventure and never being too serious. I jump into some big, long, you know, Fondo rides with our friends. But about maybe 12 years ago was the first time I got a chance to really work at the Tour de France with some of those cyclists. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what was really nice was that because I came out of this formal language of strength and conditioning, it was like I could see and understand what was happening on the bike a lot more clearly. And, you know, the problem with the bike, and there are very few problems, but the problem with the bike is that you can do a freakish amount of work in a little tiny range of motion. You can basically mm -hmm. kill yourself on this thing. <laughs> and a lot of times you can bring any body you want to the bike. And what we've done you know, traditionally is once you get into it, you were like, okay, I need to make this bike fit my body. And what we've come to realize is that there's usually a lot of very low hanging fruit around having the body actually fit the bike. And so what we're trying to do here is say, Hey, look, we don't have to be responsible for a hundred percent of everything that your body needs to be able to do in order to ride it more effectively. But if we can improve your positioning, improve your mechanical efficiency, we can improve your wattage and output and even just the, the sustained time of that wattage and output, which let's be honest, is the thing we mm -hmm. all care about the most. And what we get in the side effect of that is we restore native ranges. We're able to sort of open up tissues again that sometimes become adapted to these positions of cycling. So while we chase increased wattage, we can also get people to be more durable so that your back doesn't have to ache off the bike. Or if you're riding and suddenly you're thinking it must be my shoes or my cleat position, it may or may not be. If your neck hurts after brutal, brutal, you know, interval training, how can, what are the things that we can do to sort of restore your positioning so that you can enjoy the bike, but ultimately improve your wattage on the bike? Got it. And so like, what are the things that you see that are most common for cyclists? Uh, you mentioned their back. Um, like what are the 
things they're you know poor positioning or or not doing like mobility afterwards yeah. what do you see happens over time well what's interesting about the bike is we should we should frame it is that it's not natural and yeah. <laughs> and even the even the shift to gravel bikes people were like i love the gravel bike i'm like you like being upright on a gravel bike instead <laughs> of chewing on stem and what we should be thinking about is first and foremost is that the way the bike works isn't the way our body works to create a stable system. So what ends up happening is when we stand on the ground, we mm. actually create a lot of passive and active rotation through the whole leg. And I know that doesn't seem, that seems strange to people with your feet straight, but that rotation is how your pelvis becomes stable on your femurs. And when you have a stable pelvis on the heads of your legs, then you can have a stable lumbar and a stable thoracic spine up the chain. But what ends up happening is because that leg is independent, I can't create the same kinds of rotational stability. So then I have a seat here, and what ends up happening is our body often will default to finding these positions of stability. And I'll either overextend mm -hmm. or I'll crank myself into end range flexion. And that's fine, but the, oftentimes what ends up happening is we lose a lot of capacity in the, in the mix. Then upstream, you know, what we have is an actual real opportunity to grip or be more sort of enlightened about how we interact with the handlebars mm -hmm. so that we can create a more stable trunk head relationship and sort of begin to connect these things. And so, you know, when we're looking at cycling, we can just look at the basic shape for starters and say, well, do you have enough hip flexion? Can you bring your knee to your chest in a full and complete way? And believe it or not, a lot of athletes on the bike can't. They're missing hip flexion. Yeah. They have about 90 degrees of hip flexion. So when the, when the pedal stroke comes around and hits the apex, it's basically the femurs pushing the pelvis backwards. And so now I have this sort of tug of war between my femur pushing my pelvis backwards and mm -hmm. the rest of the structure is trying to keep my pelvis forward. And then we start playing this funny tug of war and I'll move my seat back and I'll, I'll kind of, you know, modify my positioning. I like to be more upright and that upright torso means suddenly I can't generate enough as much force or be as aerodynamic. And so we kind of solve these things intuitively instead of let's go ahead and improve your normal hip range of motion. And to be honest, riding a bike is pretty mid range. So it's not a big mm. ask. We're not asking you to be able to Olympic lift and be stapled at the bottom or be able to do a pistol. We're just saying, Hey, if we improve your hip range of motion, then what ends up happening is that we can look at some of those basic positions. If, you know, if, if I'm flexed all the way over because my pelvis is flexed, yeah. that may mean that I'm going to end up with a little bit of a rounded upper back and that's not a problem, but it may mean that I'm compromising my ability to ventilate. And that is a problem. So I want to be able to get into a position where I can take and have a choice of how much maximal breathing I can do. And it turns out when I begin to think about your shoulders and trunk positioning, I suddenly start to think about your head positioning. And so suddenly your neck is a little bit less cranked back, et cetera, et cetera. So we have these basic shapes that are pretty native to every biking position. And, it's, and again, the real ones are, hey, do I have enough ankle flexion to get my foot around? You know, do I have enough hip flexion? Does my knee flex that much? It's, it's not that much. Mm -hmm. Yep. But then we can start to ask, especially when people become so specialized at cycling, that we notice that if you don't spend time additionally in positions like hip extension, in warrior mm -hmm. poses, in yoga, or in lunge-like shapes, then you're never going to actually restore your native ranges. And so your psoas will be tight, your iliacus will be stiff, your quads will be stiff. You know, for example, yeah. there's been a lot of times where we've, we've helped athletes troubleshoot knee pain on the bike. And what we do is we lay them on their stomach and we just bring the heel towards the glute. So just flex the mm -hmm. leg. And what ends up happening is we want about, you know, maybe five inches between the heel and the butt, right? Not very much, yep. about a fist. And what ends up happening is we oftentimes see that those athletes, their leg stops at 90 degrees. And so what we have is simply an over stiff system, which means that when that knee comes around and that rectus femoris, that hip is keeping me in these 
tight isometric positions, my body is trying to solve that problem. And I may get a hot spot or this may be the mechanism for why my foot is turning out suddenly or my knee is diving in. And once again, mm -hmm. what we come around to is I either have the handbrake on the system or I'm squirreling and dumping power in these, in these ways where I can't generate the kind of power I want. And I'm certainly not working with my efficiency. So again, we can divide it into sort of two categories. What is it your body should do, be able to do it on the bike? And then secondarily, are we keeping an eye on the rest of your body self off the bike? Mm -hmm. And when we begin to come back to some of those basics, lo and behold, not only can you feel better while you ride, but you can actually generate more wattage. Absolutely. And, you know, I think for most people who are riding Pelotons are, are exercising, they haven't really done a ton of like more advanced training outside of this. And so a lot of this stuff is super foreign to them. And a lot of times, you know, people I talk to, it, the kind of only awareness is comes down to like, oh, my knee pain is my like seat height, right? And that's right. about it is my seat height, right? And like, you know, talking to you, it's like much more than just a seat height issue often because it could, your seat height could be right, but your stiffness and just your overall positioning, just not having that range of motion could also be leading to the issue regardless of what, you know, how the bike is situated around you. That's right. Um, and I think that's really, really useful. Um, and then, you know, you're mentioning and talking about mobility work and, and stiffness. And one of the other things that I see often with, because, you know, these, programs have mobility classes afterwards or five or 10 minutes. And th I think they're pretty good for like a post-workout quick stretch. But yes. one of the issues that I have with them is you never really hold anything ever longer than like 20 or 30 seconds. So like you literally have to take the same class like four times in a row, just holding it <laughs> like and again and again, if you want to like actually see change, but I don't, uh, could you maybe just really, I know you're, you gotta go, but maybe have a quick explanation or talk about, why somebody might want to spend a little bit more time stretching and positions yeah. longer than just a half a minute. Um, yeah. You know, I, I you know, I, I want everyone to know that if you don't know this about Colin is he's an insane athlete and a really good mover in strength and conditioning, as well as being able to put out a lot of wattage. And it's, it, you're sort of like a cheater. I'm just going to come around and say it. All right. <laughs> and so it's like, you have this innate ability to understand some of the needs and demands in a way that sometimes if you just come out of cycling, it's hard to see. You know, one of the mistakes I think we make is when we're thinking about post ride, which is a great time to do this kind of work because you're already warmed up. You know, some of us need to jump off the bike and go right to work, no problem. So if you can't do it immediately after the session, the best time to do it is right before you go to bed. Because we okay. find the last 10 minutes is not really a good, useful time. So if you can't immediately say, hey, I'm going to just take care of my tissues or I'm going to mobilize based on what I felt on the bike. So if you on the bike and your shoulders are stiff or your hips are stiff or sometimes I get into my sessions and my quads are just dying and it's like a specific yeah. area. I'm like, oh, that's what I need to go work on. So more the ideal thing is not to think, hey, I'm going to try to treat my whole body in this five to 10 minute session right after the bike. That's sort of the mistake. And that's, I think what we see is that it's like an amusement, it's busy work. And what ends up happening mm -hmm. is people cut it out because they don't necessarily see a gain from it. And to your point, it may not be a sufficient stimulus to actually change your positions. So the reason we mobilize typically after intense training sessions is that we know that we can reduce the session cost. I can reduce DOMS and increase my recovery so that I can do more work or I can come back tomorrow and ride. And in the, you know, the, the words of Floyd Landis, you know, he said, whoever does the most work wins, you know, and, and people were like, well, what if you're get overtrained? He's like, well, you didn't do enough work to be able to do that much work. So see mm -hmm. them. One, right? And, and it's not all equal. I mean, you are a mutant. I'm not a mutant. And which means that I can't handle the same kinds of volumes you can handle. So I have to take care of this recovery piece a little more effectively. And that can be really slow, simply asking myself, what felt worked? What did, what did I, what do I need to work on or what position? And then what I would recommend, honestly, is spending 10 minutes minimum but choose one body part 
and do five yeah. minutes on your left side and five minutes on your right side. And what you'll find is that you'll actually get enough traction and work in there that you can make a significant difference. And mm -hmm. there's, I don't know if you noticed this, but there's a lot of real estate to cover in your hamstrings. There's a lot of real estate to cover in your glutes. Yeah. So you can mix and match, but think, hey, I'm going to do 10 minutes and either right afterwards or in the evening. Mm -hmm. The other reason we mobilize besides to reduce the session costs and improve our recovery is that we're trying to improve a position and so or restore a position, which is a really great way to mobilize is that it allows me to keep an eye on minimums. And on our site, on our mm -hmm. app, we have some simple testing that you can kind of come up with movement minimums. And if that's a language you've never heard before, don't worry. It's just basically saying, for us saying, here are components to your range of motion. Do you have these minimums? And let's keep an mm -hmm. eye on it. And if, and if you got it, great. And if not, let's work towards improving those. And then the last reason to mobilize is because something is in pain. And a lot of times... Yeah. We want always people to recognize that pain is not mean tissue damage. If your knee hurts after a long ride, you're a human being and you probably, you know, have a history of moving a certain way or sitting a certain way or something happened. And it, it doesn't mean anything. I know a ton of elite cyclists whose knees hurt just because they're elite mm -hmm. cyclists. So, but what we also know is that it doesn't mean damage. It doesn't mean trauma. It doesn't mean you have knee rabies. But if we work simply up above the knee to the quadriceps or below the knee to the shin or to the calf, mm -hmm. any of those things can refer pain to the knee, but also can change how the mechanics of the knee are operating. And so a simple way for everyone to understand is that if you push on a tissue, let's say if I get you down on the ground and I'm like, here, lay on this roller on your quadriceps. If you feel discomfort during that, you have found part of the tissue system that can be improved. And so what I want everyone to know is that the bar is really low, but if your knee hurts and you go right above your knee to the quads, which are strangely attached directly to the knee and they're painful or just uncomfortable to compression, you have found a place to work. And let me give you a really simple tool to use. So what are we doing here when we're mobilizing? Well, we could be restoring sliding surfaces. We could be desensitizing this by getting the brain to think differently about it. We could be rehydrating, getting blood flow back in there. We could be changing length tension relationship. We could be altering. There's so many things that can be happening. We don't want to get caught in the weeds. What I want to mm -hmm. get caught on is better, same, worse. Did it make you feel better? Did it take away your pain? Did it improve your position or wattage? Those things are sort of are the, our keystones. But if you roll on something and you feel it hurts, stop right where you are, take a four second maximum inhale, then flex the quad as hard as you can for four seconds, and then exhale and relax for eight seconds. And repeat that four, four, eight until you start to change, until you're like, mm -hmm. oh, my brain is letting me in. And again, this could just be neurologic. We're integrating breathing here. And what we're doing here is actually just creating isometrics. We're teaching the brain to be able to generate force, which is the same thing we do with a lot of our plank holds or isometrics or bottom position mm -hmm. of the squat. And so we're integrating these isometrics here. And, you know, as a reminder, you should be able to take a full breath anytime you're doing soft tissue work. So I see people clump down, lay on their mm -hmm. IT band and then black out or like, you know, hold their breath as they go back and forth. <laughs> And the idea mm -hmm. is like, that's not enough. And you're sending a message to your brain that this is a threat. So any soft tissue work you're doing, even if you're getting a massage, if you can't take a full breath, that's too deep. And use Got your it. breathing as a nice indicator of working inappropriately. But again, if you find something that feels stiff to compression, like your calves or you're rolling around, just even without the context of the movement or the position, if you find something that is uncomfortable to, to compression, stop. Four second inhale, four second isometric, eight mm -hmm. second relax. And you can stay on that. And what's amazing is how you can begin a conversation with your body, how you can reclaim a lot of your power, you can restore your positions, and you can desensitize and sort of de threat how the brain is thinking about the body, which may be enough to restore your position and take away your knee pain in the same thing. Awesome. Awesome. So, no, there's a ton of takeaway there. And if, so for this 14 day, uh, indoor cycling mobility challenge, it starts today, right? It starts today. You it can jump today. in at any time. 
Okay. You know, and, and what we do in there is we talk about some positions, some other things. We're not going to give you a mm-hmm. lot of exercises. Okay. We're going to give you some ideas that you can drop right into whatever program you want. We're agnostic about the kinds of training you're doing, but even just thinking about differently about, hey, how can I breathe more effectively in these positions? What are my movement minimums? And if you just went through the 14 days, what you'll find is you'll discover a, thing, a few things that will really work for you. Some mm-hmm. things you do really well. It's not going to be, you know, a shock. But I think what ends up happening is that you'll be able to cherry pick, drop these in and have a better time on the bike because we're cyclists. We love biking. Awesome. And how does, uh, how does somebody sign up for it? Like where should we go? To get if you go up? to the readystate.com, you can sign okay. up right there. Um, I'm sure there are links on the social medias there mm-hmm. at the ready state, but keep in mind that even if you want to jump in now, we have a two-week free trial on the site. So you can tour the whole site. But you also notice we have a ton of other challenges on the site. So yep. what, we, what we're doing is basically creating 14 days of on-ramp programming based on something you're interested in. So you're like, hey, ankles. Oh, hey, the splits. I want to work on my squat. Mm-hmm. I want to work on my overhead positioning. You can tour around in there. But this is just going to guide you these little doses. You should be able to do the whole thing in 10 or 15 minutes a day. And what I'll say is you'll be shocked at how much better you feel after two weeks. No, absolutely. Thanks so much, Kelly, for jumping in here. Uh, again, I'm very excited about this. Uh, real quick, I'm going to pull up a quick picture. Um, oh, boy. Our video. I don't know what I found here. Uh, I thought it was hilarious. Uh, by the way, this is the Instagram. This is the uh, challenge promo. Um, and then this picture, I don't know if you can see this. This is about 12 years ago. There's uh, little Kelly, little young With Kelly. With hair. With hair. And then this is like 18-year-old me hanging out in the back. <laughs> And then, yeah, I got this, like, I just found this. It's like one of the oldest videos I have teaching the mobility seminar back in like 2008, 2009, but, uh, good times. And, uh, thanks again for jumping on here with me. I'm sure a lot of people are going to get a lot of value jumping into this challenge. I'm definitely going to be jumping in and, uh, no, thanks again, Kelly. Great to see you and uh, total pleasure and we'll see you out there. All right. All right. Thank you.